Hello and welcome to another History Burst video. This one's going to focus in on English sailors during the reign of Elizabeth I. And we're going to look at John Hawkins and Francis Drake. Now these were English sailors involved in exploration, the looting of Spanish ships, the sale of goods in West Africa and the slave trade, selling enslaved Africans in the West Indies. Now the slave trade involving West Africa in the West Indies was known as the triangular trade. Uh, those involved in the trade may choose profits from selling the people that were kidnapped into a life of slavery, as well as from the sugar and tobacco produced on slave plantations. John Hawkins was England's first slave trader. In 1562, he sails from Plymouth with three ships and violently kidnapped around 400 West Africans and later sold them as slaves in the West Indies. Between 1562 and 1567, Hawkins and his cousin Francis Drake made three voyages to West Africa and enslaved between 1,200 and 1,400 Africans. Hawkins then crossed the Atlantic and sold his cargo to the Spanish. Now, many Africans died on the voyage owing to the terrible conditions in which they were kept and this period of the journey is known as the Middle Passage. Now Hawkins was unashamed of his role within the slave trade and his coat of arms even went on to feature a bound slave. Now Francis Drake was an English sea captain, a privateer, a navigator, a slave trader and a politician. He carried out the second circumnavigation of the world from 1577 to 1580 and he began an era of privateering and piracy on the western coast of the Americas, an area that had previously been three of piracy. So why then were voyages of exploration made during Elizabethan times? Well, one reason was to expand your territory. Voyages of exploration enabled explorers to claim territory for Elizabeth's government, especially in the New World, leading to settlement and colonisation. Some people did it for trade. English merchants needed new trading opportunities as war with Spain and in the Netherlands had severely damaged the wool and cloth trades. Another reason could be private investment and our private investors, including the Queen herself and her courtiers, funded many of the voyages of discovery. Although this was risky, the rewards could be enormous. There'd been improvements in ship design. Ships or galleons had bigger sails. They were faster, they were easier to move and had greater firepower against attack by pirates. They were also more stable and could take on more supplies, encouraging longer voyages and exploration. Some young Elizabethan men, such as Francis Drake, set off on voyages of discovery and exploration for adventure. Their published accounts of these voyages, though often inaccurate, persuaded others to venture into the unknown in the belief that fortunes could be made. New technology, such as the development of devices such as quadrants and astrolabes made navigation more precise, so voyages were safer and faster, leading to more exploration and trade. Also, the development of standardised maps, such as the Mercator map of 1569, meant sailors and traders could be confident they were going in the right direction. This reduced the risks of exploration and encouraged further voyages. The Portuguese explorer Ferdinand Magellan was the first man to sail the globe between 1519 and 1522. However, Francis Drake circumnavigated the globe between December 1577 and September 1580, and after he completed his voyage, he was knighted by Queen Elizabeth. 
Francis Drake circumnavigated the globe for the following reasons. He was attacking Spain. He didn't mean to sail the globe, but he was attacking the Spanish colonies in the Pacific, as relations with Spain were declining at this time. He was doing it for revenge. The Spanish had attacked Drake's fleet at San Juan de Ulua, and most of his men had been killed. He also did it for profit. Loot, booty and trade meant there were huge profits to be made from Drake's proposed journey to the Americas and beyond, so people were willing to invest in the expedition, including Elizabeth I. This is the map showing his route around the globe between 1577 and 1580. Now how did Drake's expedition benefit England? Well, England's reputation as a seafaring power increased. In spite of the fact that only one of Drake's five ships, the Golden Hind, survived the voyage, Drake had overcome considerable difficulties in sailing around the globe. His expedition resulted in Nova Albion, an area near San Francisco being claimed as English territory, with Elizabeth as its queen. Now this encouraged further trade and exploration, especially to the New World, where colonies were established in New England in the late 16th and 17th centuries. England's naval power increased as a way of defending the country from invasion and protecting its trading interests. Drake's achievement boosted the income of Elizabeth and her government, and this improved England's status as a European power. It also made her a potential ally for other European states who also saw Spain as a rival power. English ships began to trade elsewhere, such as in China, West Africa and India, and this established England as a major trading power. One of the key purposes of Elizabethan exploration was to open up profitable trading routes, including the Northwest Passage and routes to West Africa, the Americas and the Far East. The Martin Frobisher made three voyages in search of a northwestern route to China and the Far East. The first left in 1576 and reached Greenland. The second in 1577 reached Baffin Island but found nothing of value. And the third expedition in 1578 was completely unsuccessful. Three further expeditions by John Davis were equally unsuccessful. Expeditions to colonise the East Coast of America were also unsuccessful. An expedition in 1578 by Humphrey Gilbert was abandoned and his second in 1583 reached Newfoundland, but many of the colonists fell ill and Gilbert himself died on the way home. Attempts to settle colonists in Virginia on Roanoke Island from 1585 also came to nothing and the colony mysteriously disappeared. As we've already seen, the slave trader John Hawkins helped establish the triangular trade, and this involved selling goods in West Africa, such as rum, textiles and manufactured goods, purchasing enslaved people in Western Africa and selling them in the West Indies, and then buying sugar, tobacco and cotton in the West Indies and returning to England. And this trade was further strengthened when the Barbary Company, which traded off the west coast of Africa, was established in 1585. Now in 1582, Elizabeth I sent Ralph Fitch to be ambassador to the Emperor of China. He was captured by the Portuguese but managed to escape and travelled through northern India, Burma and Malaya before returning to England in 1591. His account of his travels showed that profitable trade in the east was possible. The Levant Company was set up in 1592 to trade with the Eastern Mediterranean and it supplied the English market with Turkish carpets, Mediterranean fruits and Persian silks, as well as spices and luxury goods. It successfully exported textiles to the Turks. And then in 1600, the East India Company was set up to trade with China, India and the East in cotton, silk, salt, tea and opium. It encouraged merchants and aristocrats to invest in these trading opportunities and by the late 17th century it dominated trade between England and India and had its own private army and trading ships. So how did England benefit from exploration and trade? 
but English traders and merchants made big profits from trading with other countries. The Crown benefited by charging duties or taxes on imported goods. It also made money by granting trading licenses to organisations like the Barbary Company and the East India Company. And trade allowed access to new goods, including potatoes, tobacco, coffee, spices and dried grapes, which could then enter the English market. Walter Raleigh was an influential courtier and explorer throughout Elizabeth I's reign. Now, Walter Raleigh was an English nobleman and explorer and a favourite of Queen Elizabeth. He took part in military expedition to Ireland in 1580. This gained him enormous favour with Elizabeth I and he was given land there following the defeat of a local rebellion. In 1584, Queen Elizabeth granted Walter Raleigh a royal charter for seven years, which allowed him to explore take over and rule any land that were not Christian or ruled by Christians in return for one-fifth of all the gold and silver mined there. And in 1587 he was named Captain of the Queen's Guard, the highest office at court. The Royal Charter enabled Raleigh to organise and make money from expeditions to the New World. So Walter Raleigh undertook several expeditions uh, throughout his time. In 1585, after the first fact-finding expedition in 1584, 170 settlers set out for Roanoke, Virginia in North America. In 1586, these colonists returned to England, abandoning Virginia. Then in 1587, a new group of settlers set sail for Roanoke. And then in 1590, English sailors found Roanoke abandoned. And what happened remains a mystery even to today. And no further colonisation takes place until the early 17th century. However, in 1595, Sir Walter Raleigh led an expedition to the Orinoco River Basin in South America in search for the city of gold, El Dorado. In 1595, he also attacks the Spanish coast, capturing the merchant ship, the Mother of God. Between 1596 and 1597, he took part in the capture of Cadiz, as well as raiding Spanish bases in the Azores. In 1616, he led a second expedition to South America in search of El Dorado, and he is then executed in 1618 for attacking Spanish shipping without the king's wishes. Now, Raleigh's relationship with Elizabeth changed between 1580 and 1603. Military successes in Ireland in 1580 made him a favourite and Elizabeth granted him lands and made him captain of the guard. However, he fell out of favour in 1592 for secretly marrying one of the Queen's maids of honour, Elizabeth Throckmorton, and was expelled from court and sent to the Tower. Later, military expeditions to Spain, leading to the capture of Cadiz in 1597 and South America, were an attempt to win back the Queen's favour. Now, this seemed to work as he was made Governor of Jersey in 1600. But why was Raleigh important? Well, he encouraged exploration and colonisation of the New World by getting investors, aristocrats and merchants to fund expeditions. And this set an example and led to further expeditions. Raleigh's failures, especially at Roanoke, Virginia, changed the way English governments approached colonisation. While Raleigh raised money among his friends, his future colonisation used joint stock companies where investors brought shares in expeditions. Now these companies paid a share of the profits to the shareholders and this further led to investment. Join us next time as we look at the religious problems faced by Elizabeth I.